the women I meet uh, ask me my star sign. I used to take this as an opportunity to set them straight. I'd uh, explain to them just how implausible astrology was, given everything we knew about how the world really works, and I'd tell them that astrology had in fact been tested and refuted. At, at least that's what I'd tell them if I already had a girlfriend. Um, it, it was a waste of time. Uh, I never changed their minds. I just annoyed them. Indeed, they would often accuse me of trying to violate one of their rights, namely their right to their own opinion. Everybody seems to think that they have this right, or that we all have this right. The idea that we do not simply hold our beliefs, but that we're entitled to hold them, is a truism of modern democracy. But like many truisms of modern democracy, it's false. We're not really entitled to our opinions, nor should we be, because such an entitlement is the enemy of intellectual progress. It creates a kind of intellectual protectionism, analogous to economic protectionism, that restricts free trade and ideas, and with it, the progress that comes with that free trade. That's what I mean to uh, convince you of in the next 20 minutes. Now, to see what's wrong with the idea that we have a right to our opinion, we need only understand one fact about rights, namely that they entail duties. In fact, rights are defined by the duties that they create. Consider an example. The law gives us all a right to life. Your right to life means that everybody else has a duty not to kill you. This isn't something that the government might or might not associate with your right to life. It is your right to life. A law that did not impose on others a duty not to kill you would thereby fail to establish your right to life. Does your right to life mean that others have a duty to feed you, to house you, to clothe you, and so on? Well, those are hotly debated questions, but nobody doubts that the answers to the, these questions about others' duties is what defines and delimits your right to life. So, when anyone claims a right, the first question to ask is, what duties is this right supposed to entail on the part of others? That will tell you what the right is supposed to be, and it will also provide a good test of whether there really is or should be any such right. Because it will often be obvious that it would be preposterous to claim that people had the implied duties. For example, I once heard an Australian government minister claim that every child had a right to be loved. But who could possibly have a duty to love every child, or even a duty to love a single child? Of course it would be nice if all children were loved. But that's irrelevant, that something would be nice to have, such as long eyelashes or 10 million pounds, dollars, whatever, uh, does not mean that anybody has a duty to provide you with it, nor therefore that you have a right to it. So to get back to our opinions, what duties uh, is it that the right to your opinions entails for other people? Now, here we should uh, briefly distinguish between two kinds of rights or two ways of understanding rights. What's often known as a claim, or sometimes as an entitlement or a positive right, and what's known as liberties. If you have a claim on something, then others have a duty to provide you with it. So for example, if we've in entered into a contract and I've fulfilled my side of the contract, then I have a claim on you to fulfill your side of the contract. You have a positive duty to provide me with something. And if, the, if our right to life, for example, is a claim against the state to provide us with a, a living, then that means that the state is obliged to give us the means to life. Now, a liberty is a weaker kind of right. Uh, it's not a claim. If you have a liberty to do something, such as to live, then others have a duty not to prevent you from doing it. That's all there is to it. They don't have any obligation to provide you with a means or to give you anything. They just mustn't interfere with you in exercising that liberty. Now, the idea that we have a claim on our beliefs, that our right to believe what we want is a claim, is absurd. It doesn't really even make sense. What would it mean to say uh, that you have a duty to provide me with certain beliefs? I mean, I'd like to believe, for example, that I'm immortal. Uh, but who, I can't. Nobody can provide me with that belief. Who should I sue for the failure to give me that belief? So if we have a right to our beliefs, they must be a liberty not a claim. The right must be a liberty. Uh, it must mean that others, others have a duty not to force us to change our beliefs. <clears throat> now, 
uh, you may be sympathetic to this idea. You probably think that no one should force anybody to change their beliefs about anything. Uh, but this is a hopeless ideal because the only way to get beliefs is to have them forced on you. Believing something is not a matter of choice. You can test this for yourself. Try to believe something that you don't now believe. For example, that you're the king of England or that you can fly. Now I'll give you a moment, try to believe it. So you can't. Uh, believing is not like dressing. You can't pick the beliefs that suit you. Believing something is more like getting freckles. Stand out in the sun and they're forced upon you. At least they are if you have my kind of skin. Uh, beliefs are not forced on you by threats of violence or other penalties. That kind of force, political coercion as I'll call it, cannot change what you believe. If I threaten to feed you to the lions, if you do not give up your belief that London is in England, you may say that you no longer believe it, but the threat will not have actually changed your mind. It won't actually have changed your beliefs. You'll be merely lying to save yourself. Beliefs can be acquired and changed only in certain ways. Most often, they're forced upon you by the interaction of your sense organs with reality. Few of you uh, will now believe that I have a large tattoo of Hillary Clinton on my stomach. But if I were to open my shirt and reveal one, uh, you would soon believe it, and with no choice in the matter. Uh, don't worry. I don't, and I'm not going to prove it. But even when beliefs are not acquired directly from our senses, but are arrived at by a process of considering evidence and arguments, still it's not a matter of choice what you end up believing. Either the evidence or the arguments convince you, or they do not. We cannot choose how our minds will react to, uh, will react to these arguments any more than we can choose whether or not our skin freckles uh, in the sun. In short, our beliefs are not formed and changed by threats or bribes or any other kind of political coercion. They are formed and changed by the force of argument and evidence, including what comes directly from our sense organs. So a right to hold on to your beliefs is not a protection against political coercion, it's a protection against evidence and argument. It obliges other people not to prove you wrong. That is why we cannot simultaneously have a right to hold our opinions and a right to express them, or at least why those rights are at odds with each other. If you are to respect my right to my opinions, you must not say anything that might change my mind. The right to your own opinions therefore creates what I call intellectual protectionism. It shields belief from competition with other beliefs in the way that economic protectionism shields companies from competition with other companies. And just as economic protectionism promotes waste because it prevents inefficient companies from going out of business, so intellectual protectionism creates, uh, promotes falsity because it shields false beliefs from public refutation. The idea that people are entitled to their opinions is the enemy of intellectual progress. That's why it's not just a silly idea, but a dangerous idea. If you consider ordinary everyday beliefs, the idea that people violate our rights by changing our opinions is clearly absurd. No one thinks that there either is or should be any such right. In such matters, no one is an intellectual protectionist. Consider an example. Suppose that you're about to cross the road with a friend. Knowing that she is, uh, and she, you see a car coming, and yet she takes a stride into the street. Knowing that she's not suicidal, you infer that she is of the belief that no cars are coming. Are you obliged to let her keep that belief? Obviously not. You ought to take every reasonable measure to change her opinion, perhaps saying, look out, a car's coming. By doing this, you've not violated her rights. On the contrary, she'll probably thank you. The list of matters on which no one seeks protection, the protection of their beliefs is almost endless. No one will complain if you tell them that the butter is not where they think it is, or that they haven't received the change that they were owed, or that they've got a crumb on their lip. Yet on certain matters, many people do take this alleged right to hold an opinion seriously. 
Some beliefs are deemed special and their robust scrutiny is constrained either by good manners or by corporate codes of conduct or in some cases by the law. The culture of respect for beliefs that are associated with our supposed identities means that some, someone with utterly preposterous beliefs can go through life, including even a university degree, without having them seriously challenged. Uh, in the United States, though the law defends freedom of speech, cultural convention stifles it. It would be a brave employee in the New York office of my company, for example, who entered into a serious discussion about religion or sexuality in the lunchroom. Uh, he would almost certainly become a social pariah, and he could even lose his job. The former head of uh, Harvard University uh, w lost his job, uh, at least in part, for making a speech in which he said that there are relatively few female physicists or physics professors because relatively few women have the peculiar mental capacities for the job. This is simply unsayable. Research suggests it's true, uh, but the belief that there are no statistical differences, intellectual differences between men and women is protected. Not by law, perhaps, but by the customs of the educational establishment. Part of knowing uh, how to get ahead professionally nowadays is knowing which beliefs are protected and which beliefs are not. When Larry Summers, the head of uh, Harvard, previous head of Harvard, made that catastrophic speech, many people must have wondered how he could be such a fool, not for believing what he does about women in physics, but for saying it out loud. This protection of culturally sensitive beliefs is not restricted to America, of course. In 2006, in my native New Zealand, uh, an attempt to use genetic information to plot the ancient migration of people of the ancestors of Polynesians from Asia into the Pacific uh, ran into trouble. Maori uh, political activists, Maoris are the uh, indigenous Polynesian New Zealanders, uh, Maori political activists encouraged other Maori uh, to deny the researchers anything that had usable genetic information in it, such as blood samples or a scrape from the inside of the mouth. A lecture in Maori studies at Auckland University claimed that the genetic research was a kind of intellectual imperialism. Maoris already knew perfectly well where they came from uh, because their legends told them so where it was. So serious research should be stifled so that myths about full-grown men emerging, emerging from the bellies of animals and being consumed in the vagina of the Earth Mother uh, could be preserved as the literal truth. Maoris allegedly have a right to believe whatever they want about their own history without interference from science. As usual, the law lags the cultural elite, but it is catching up. A recent United Nations Human Rights Council resolution, sponsored by the United States and Egypt, declared that everybody has a right to hold his opinion without interference, and warned against stereotyping of religions and cultures. This was a watered down version of a draft which had prohibited the denigration of religion or religions. In Britain, uh, inciting racial or religious hatred and inciting hatred on the ground of sexuality have recently been criminalized. And the leader of a political party uh, with 2% support has now been, or has since been convicted of inciting racial hatred. Remember, this isn't inciting a racial crime. It's in, uh, a crime against anybody. It's, in, it's the crime of inciting feelings in people. Uh, <clears throat> Now, like me, you probably dislike racism and prejudice against homosexuals. But you should dislike the protection of your beliefs even more. Because once the idea of intellectual protectionism is accepted, all sorts of people will seek it for their beliefs. And as with economic protectionism, those who get preferential treatment will be those who need it and those who can lobby successfully. The companies that need, economic, that need uh, protection from competition are those that are inefficient, those that are wasting resources. But only the big ones, such as General Motors or, or Citibank, have the political influence to get the required uh, protection. So perversely, the more resources that you're wasting, the more likely you are to get government support. 
Similarly, intellectual protectionism will be sought by people with obviously false beliefs, and it will, be it will be achieved only when the belief in question is shared by enough people, or by important enough people, to give it political influence. So, perversely, the more widespread an error, the more likely it is to be protected. The answer is not to be careful about giving only true beliefs protection. That is never how the politics of protectionism works out. And true beliefs don't need protection anyway. The answer is to give up on the whole idea. The answer is to deny that anybody has a right to his opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much.